Hello. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nirav Shah. I'm the director of the, Maine State, the State of Maine Center for Disease Control and Prevention. I'm joined this afternoon by Governor Janet Mills and Commissioner Heather Johnson from the Department of Economic and Community Development. We're here today to provide an update on the COVID-19 situation across the state of Maine. I'd like to start by providing some, uh, uh, an update on where things stand and then turn things over to Governor Mills. And today's update, again, begins on a very sad note. The Maine CDC is aware and now reporting five additional individuals who have passed away from COVID-19. All five of these individuals was a resident at the Maine Veterans Home in Scarborough. One was a gentleman in his 50s from Cumberland County. Another was a gentleman in his 70s, also from Cumberland County. The third was also a gentleman in his 70s from Cumberland County. The fourth, a gentleman in his 90s, again from Cumberland County. And the fifth, again, a gentleman in his 90s, also from Cumberland County. Each of these men was a veteran. Each of these men served his country. And we'd like to just take a moment to honor that selfless service to this country during its time of need. As always, everyone here at the state of Maine offers our condolences to the families of these individuals during this time of grief. Overall, the Maine CDC is now reporting 937 cases of COVID-19, an increase of 30 cases since yesterday. As we'll talk about in a moment, many of these cases are associated with outbreaks at long-term care facilities. Overall, 150 individuals have been hospitalized at some point during their COVID-19 illness, an increase of six since yesterday. And as I noted, there are now 44 deaths statewide, an unfortunate increase of five. 485 individuals have recovered, an increase of 30. At present, there are 18 individuals in the state who are in intensive care units related to their COVID-19 illness, which is the same number as yesterday. Similarly, there are 24 individuals in non-intensive care unit beds, also the same number as yesterday. And one additional individual is now on a ventilator, bringing that total to 11. All told, there are currently 229 healthcare workers who have been infected with COVID-19 since, the, since we began our activation. I'd like next to provide a quick update on the various outbreaks at long-term care facility and assisted living facilities that Maine CDC is working with right now. The first is at the Augusta Center for Health and Rehabilitation, where there are currently 47 residents, 28 staff, and unfortunately three deaths. That's an increase of one staff member since yesterday for a total of 75. The next is Falmouth by the Sea, where there have been eight residents, 10 staff uh, who have been infected with COVID-19. The next is the Maine Veterans Home in Scarborough, where there again have been 30 residents, 18 staff, and as I mentioned now, unfortunately, five additional individuals who have passed for a total of 10. At the Tall Pines facility in Waldo County, there have been 31 residents and 11 staff who have tested positive. That's an increase of one additional resident and one additional staff member for a total of 42 cases affiliated with Tall Pines. At the Cedars facility in Portland, the numbers there remain the same of seven residents and four staff members for a total of 11. And at the Edgewood Rehabilitation Center, the numbers there again remain the same, two residents and one staff member, and we are awaiting test results from the universal testing that was offered yesterday and the swabs that were taken. Finally, I'd like to just provide an update on deliveries of personal protective equipment from yesterday and today. 
Yesterday, I detailed the nearly 600,000 pieces of personal protective equipment that have been delivered to Maine healthcare facilities and first responders since we first began our activation. Yesterday alone, 28,000 pieces of PPE were delivered in 52 separate shipments. The vast majority of those shipments went to congregate care settings, like the nursing homes that we've been talking about. Similarly, today, 35 deliveries will be made uh, and, and picked today and delivered tomorrow. Again, and the bulk of those will also be going to congregate care settings across the state. And finally, before I turn things over to Governor Mills, a brief update on the vital medical assets that we've been tracking. The first is with respect to the number of ICU beds. There are a total of 306 ICU beds in the state, 158 of which are available. There are 333 conventional ventilators in the state, 281 of which are available, and there remain available 367 alternative ventilators. Thank you very much. I'd like to turn things now over to Governor Mills. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. And thank your staff for all the excellent work they've been doing day and night for the last five plus weeks. Um, your state thanks you, 1.3 million people in this state. Thank every member of the CDC, all the professionals, the epidemiologists, the public health nurses, uh, and the great leadership that you have provided to that division and to the state of Maine. The state of Maine has joined all other states in confronting the most serious threat to life and safety of our people in more than 100 years. Like other states, Maine has seen hundreds of people fall seriously ill and dozens of people lose their lives as a result of this virus. The virus has reared its ugly head in every county in Maine and too many people have died. This virus does not discriminate. It is not an urban or a rural disease, not an old person's or a young person's illness. It does not care whether you are male or female old or young, wealthy or poor, whether you work in a mill or a diner, a corner store or a back office. It knows no state or county lines, no international boundaries. It does not care how big or small your bank account or whether you have a line of credit. It is an equal opportunity killer. If you have lungs, it will find you and try to take your breath and your life away. There is no treatment at this point. There is no vaccine. The virus, as you know, is transmitted by personal contact. That's why all 50 states have invoked their emergency executive powers. It is why the president has declared every state a federal disaster area. It is why the overwhelming majority of all states have issued strict stay home, stay healthy at home orders and orders prohibiting large gatherings and other common recreational and business activities. We all want life to return to normal as soon as it's safe to do so. Our hearts break to see closed storefronts and people struggling to make ends meet. Each day people call me and write me and tell me their story and urge me to keep people safe while also doing everything we can to protect the businesses and the lives of working men and women who are the heart and soul of our state. At the same time, they and we know that reopening too soon and too aggressively is likely to cause a secondary surge in COVID-19 cases, jeopardizing the lives of many more Maine people, overwhelming our healthcare system, and further destabilizing our economy. None of us want that. That's the truth and I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. Here in Maine, we are pursuing cautious reopening tailored to our state's unique demographics and economic sectors. Our approach will not be driven by artificial deadlines or generic guidelines, or it will be driven by public health considerations, fact and science, and it will be done in collaboration with you in the private sector the basic principles that Maine will follow as we reopen our economy over time are one, 
protecting the public health. The state of Maine will continue to rely on epidemiological data such as case trends, hospitalization rates, recoveries, and deaths to inform the decisions we make along with the private sector in lifting restrictions. Two, maintaining health care readiness. Maine must retain its ca capacity to respond to any surge in this virus. To that end, the state will continue to work closely with all hospitals and health care providers to assess system capacity, including available hospital beds, ICU beds, ventilators, and we will continue to procure and distribute personal protective equipment as needed to hospitals, nursing facilities, emergency service, service personnel, and other frontline responders. Three, building reliable and accessible testing. Testing capacity for all people who are symptomatic and, dis and sentinel disease surveillance are key elements of reopening various sectors of our economy. While the widespread availability of rapid testing remains a challenge, the state is actively seeking to expand testing to make it more accessible to Maine people. Four, prioritizing public-private cooperation and collaboration. Collaboration and leadership among businesses, employees, government entities, and the public, you. Those are vital to develop, oversee, and adapt guidelines and safe practices. Government alone cannot fix things. Government doesn't always have the answers. We need the best thinking of all Maine people from every industry and every corner of the state to reimagine and reinvent how we do things in this state in a way that protects both our lives and our livelihoods. All activities and businesses are important to the resurgence of our economy. That's why the administration's approach will utilize criteria and measures that are currently under development by the Maine CDC. And that will lead to a phased reopening of the economy. In its planning, the Maine CDC will also develop measures to detect a resurgence in that virus, anything that might necessitate a reimposition of restrictions, something we don't want to have to do, but we've got to be keep our eyes on it on things. Meanwhile, the Department of Economic and Community Development, headed by Heather Johnson over in the corner, will solicit from industries and various sectors of Maine's economy their ideas on how we can collaborate. They can collaborate with state government. We can collaborate with them to develop practical, reasonable evidence-informed protocols to allow them to safely resume operations and activities once the public health benchmark benchmarks are met. Together we're analyzing specific business practices, considering modifications to activities, and consulting with public health experts to ensure that we protect the public health at every step. Accommodations may be as simple as Closing the break room at work, letting people work flexible hours, installing plexiglass shields, or they may be as complex as a business changing its entire sales process. But we are asking questions like, can the activity be conducted in a manner that keeps social distancing and that minimizes close personal interaction? Something we all miss. What is the impact of that activity or business on movement or travel? This is something I'm discussing with the other New England governors. Will it encourage people to travel within or into our state from high incidence areas to lower incidence areas, risking the spread of the virus? What is the inevitable congregation effect of this business or activity? Does it attract crowds? How social is that activity and how can we address the innate desire to gather in group settings. To gather information and ideas in a robust way, we're opening a public portal on our website for, for business owners, employees, and residents to offer positive suggestions about particular industries and activities. 
we invite Maine people to take part in the discussion. Give us your ideas on how we can do things differently within the principles outlined above, how we can restart the economy and keep our people safe and healthy, respecting the enormous burdens that are already endured by our selfless health care providers. While we won't be able to implement everybody's suggestions, we want to provide a path for members of the public to share all of their good ideas. While we plan on how to reopen business and activities of all sorts, and while we dream of going back to the way things were, we also know things will not return to normal soon. We call on each other to reimagine how we do things as members of a common society, how we invent different ways of doing business, shopping, traveling, recreating, taking care not just of ourselves, but of every man, woman, and child in Maine for whom we are now equally responsible. This morning, a person in recovery emailed me to say, quote, I worry for people that I know are in the high-risk groups and the people who do not know they are at high risk. But I'm not helpless. There is something I can do. I can stay home. I can do my part to help flatten the curve. I can put others' needs before my own. I am part of a community now, he said, something I didn't have in active addiction. I miss so much now, but I want to do no harm. Another person wrote, quote, I have a business, a shellfish farm, that has been greatly affected by COVID-19. However, I am willing to sacrifice in order to keep people alive and healthy and to relieve the burden on Maine's health care systems and families. I am only one voice, and I am not rich by any means, but I would rather lose money than lose loved ones, she said. Today, we heard the sobering statistics from Dr. Shaw. 30 new cases, five deaths, more than in any previous day, bringing the total number of lives lost to 44. At least 10 of those individuals were veterans of the armed services. It is, it is to honor their lives and out of gratitude for their service and out of concern for the health and safety of all citizens that we take measured steps, that we act with compassion, that we tread with caution. The approach we take, take is defined by flexibility, practicality, listening, and continued communication. It's not measured by hard lines or fixed timetables or dubious deadlines. All people in this state are stakeholders. Churches, coaches, artists, clerks, teachers, waiters, union members, community leaders, homemakers, retirees, business owners, large and small. And everything we do now together affects everybody else. After all, we know Maine is not just a state or a way of life or a dot on the map with 1.3 million people, someplace between the 42nd and 47th parallel on the globe. Maine is a community of souls, a state of givers and doers, people with ideas, courage, and compassion. And now is the time to let our true selves shine. Thank you. Thank you very much, Governor Mills. We'll now turn to some questions from our colleagues in the media. And today's first question goes to Emily Tadlock from WABI. Go ahead, Emily. Hi, thanks so much, Dr. Shaw and Governor Mills. Um, maybe this is a question for both of you, actually. Um, Governor Mills, your stay healthy at home order is set to end a week from today. Will that phase three opening begin then, or will you be extending that order? I'm sorry, will the, will the what begin then? The, the, fa well, the phase will your phased reopening. Phase reopening. Oh, oh, phased reopening. I'm sorry. <clears throat> She's asking about this stay-at-home order, which by its terms expires a week from today. We'll be monitoring things day by day, keeping track of the epidemiolo epidemiological data, 
as I said, uh, keeping track of activities. Uh, as Dr. Shaw has described early in earlier uh, press briefings, um, we keep track of some travel data, activity data, and obviously hospitalizations. So it's a day-by-day -day thing. We have no plan yet to either re re renew it or to let it expire, but we'll be reviewing it. Thanks for that question, Emily. We'll turn next to Phil Hirschhorn from WMTW. Go ahead, Phil. Uh, thanks. Uh, hope you can hear me. Dr. Shaw, just a fact check, and then I want to ask the governor a question. The short fact check for you is with those five more deaths today, can you say how many of the total 44 are attributed to residents of long-term health care facilities? And for the governor, just following up that previous question, uh, your education commissioner already moved the goalpost, so to speak, from May 1st to June 15th in terms of shutting things down, saying schools should remain closed and immediately Portland and Lewiston and other districts complied. Are you in any way worried Mainers are developing some sort of false hope for saving the month of May or Memorial Day weekend or June? What is your hope realistically for reopening the state and saving the summer? Uh, Phil, I'll, I'll do the, the fact checking first, Governor. Um, so, Phil, of, of the of the five individuals who we reported passing away, uh, all five were residents of a long term care facility. And overall, uh, since we've begun our work, there have now been 23 individuals in long term care facilities who have passed away, Governor. Right. Uh, I'm not clear on your question, Phil, but I think you're saying that the education commissioner and our administration has basically told the schools not to expect to reopen this semester this school year before the end of this school year and that's that's accurate because schools in in classroom teaching at least involves groups of people getting together and a high potential of spreading the virus that's still the case um, that's consistent with the other orders we have in effect right now about large gatherings memorial day is five weeks away at least I think um, I can't tell people what to expect for Memorial Day and we've been through several holidays together now dealing with this virus Patriots Day and Easter and Passover and you know um, and Ramadan right now so um, we're gonna take it one step at a time thanks Phil we'll turn next but you'd to like to save the summer of course that's crucial to our state's economy save the summer Oh, is that what you said, Phil? I'm sorry. Save the summer? Yes. I mean, I guess the question is, if, if it's not safe to reopen schools to mid-June, why is it safe to reopen anything else? At the same time, we do want to save the summer economically. I'd love to save the summer economically, of course. You know, we're dealing, this, we're dealing with this one sector at a time, one aspect of our activities at a time. For instance, um, we may look at different protocols for tennis courts. There may be a way for tennis courts to open without people handling the same tennis ball. It might be a lot more challenging to open basketball courts because there's a lot more physical interaction. That kind of thing is what we're looking at, a functional analysis. It's not about the month or the day or the season. It's about protecting people and preventing uh, personal, in personal um, inter interactions. Same thing with, re with regard to the beaches and um, uh, amusement parks and that kind of thing. We're going to step one step at a time. Thanks, Phil. We'll turn next to Amy Brown at WERU. Go ahead, Amy. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Uh, we're getting a lot of questions about tourist season, which is already starting a little bit early with some of the people who own homes here returning early for the summer. Uh, and so some of the questions are, uh, if, if uh, people from other states are still being reported only in their own state's rosters. Oh. How will the public know if there's an outbreak in a town here, many of which see their population demographics shift significantly when people who have summer homes return? Uh, so there may be many residents if there were an outbreak in a town not reported under our reporting system because they uh, come from other states. And then also, assuming the two-week quarantine period continues for people from other, other states when they get to Maine. We should be putting up signs at marinas as well. We had someone who worked in the boating industry ask specifically about that and whether or not if uh, cruise ships decide to run again from some other places, will they be allowed to dock in Maine? Uh, I'll, 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 I can, uh, Governor, yeah, Governor, I'll, I'll, I'll start if you, if you don't mind. Um, so Amy asks first, 
as we go into the summer, if individuals are coming into Maine who may be full-time residents of other states, how might we know, how would the public know if there were an outbreak? And a Amy, um, and, and for everyone watching, I, I want to be, I want to assure everyone, even though a case that uh, uh, may be diagnosed in Maine, but say is someone who's a full-time resident of New Hampshire, that case might get reported by New Hampshire. But if there were an outbreak, if there were a facility or if there was an outbreak associated with a particular gathering, that's not something that we would outsource to another state's health department. We would be on top of that. Our disease detectives would be investigating it and we would be publicly reporting it and sharing all the data with everybody. So A, everyone knew what was going on and B, you could take steps for example, our epidemiologists might call you as part of the contact tracing we've been doing for several months. You may get a phone call, even if the cases that started that outbreak were among residents in other states. So I just want to be very clear. The state that reports where a case is, is completely different from how we think about, report, and investigate outbreaks. And as, as for cruise ships, last I knew that the federal order was still in effect. Uh, basically prohibiting cruise ships from docking. Uh, and um, I've heard of the cancellation of a lot of cruise ships for this coming season. Uh, that's about all I know about cruise ships. We'd be putting up signs at the marinas and got in touch with us who worked in boating who expressed concerns that not everyone enters the state via, via that's motor right. vehicle. Some people take by boat. That's a great suggestion. Uh, I don't know if Heather's talked with uh, with many of the coastal people about that yet, but uh, she's asking about notifying people who sail into Maine as opposed to driving in or flying in about the quarantine mandate. Yeah, I think it's a great suggestion to to put some signage in some of these marinas that, that we hadn't considered that yet, so we can add that to our list certainly. And the federal CDC did extend the cruise ship no sail, no sail. the no sail for cruise ships, so that that is under under effect right now. Thanks. We'll turn next to Eric Russell at the Portland Press Herald. Go ahead, Eric. Uh, good afternoon, guys. Thanks for taking the time. I have a couple of questions, if I could. Um, based on, you know, I know you guys use a lot of data models and projections. Based on the current projections and trajectory, is there any sense of when we might see a two-week decline in new cases per day that is part of the criteria for when things might reopen? And the second question I have is, in Waldo County, and I think this is largely because of the Tall Pines outbreak, there have been 10 deaths, but only three hospitalizations. Are people choosing not to go to the hospital and try to live on a ventilator? And why do you think that might be? And is it advised? Uh, great. I, Governor, I can field both of those. Sure. If, if is it advised is a pretty personal issue. Yeah, that, that's, I that's I think, between... That between the family and their and their religious counselors. But um, so uh, as to your, your first question, Eric, uh, Eric's first question is around what, what might any of our models show in terms of when we might reach a point of, of 14 days or any number of days of leveling off of cases? And, you know, Eric, um, it, it's a good question. It's one that's very much on our minds. It's something that we've been thinking about. And the models don't really predict when we might hit that point. The models, are, their, their, their function is to make different projections of hundreds of different types of scenarios and then enable us to plan for those. So none of our models is telling us a date at which we might begin or complete a 14-day diminution in cases or anything of that nature. You know, I think the bottom line is that the virus does as the virus does our job is to respond to it. We can't really control what the virus is doing, but we can control our response and thereby hope to spread it. So we don't really have any projections as much as we have planning scenarios, depending on what the complexion of the outbreak looks like. Uh, in terms of your second question about tall pines, uh, you're correct with respect to the numbers. Uh, we can't speculate or don't have any insight into any particular facility and why any of the residents at one facility versus another may decide to stay in a facility versus go to the hospital. What I can tell you, though, is that that, site, that type of advanced care planning is certainly part of any discussion that any resident has when they start taking up residents in a long-term care facility. 
Uh, and those decisions are one that are, of course, highly personal and very much between the resident, their family member, their care provider, and any other spiritual counselors they might have. We don't really, uh, we don't track any data on that, and we do recognize that different folks make different uh, decisions in that regard. So thanks for that question, Eric. Uh, we'll turn next to Caitlin Andrews from the BDN. Hi, thank you. I have a question for Dr. Shaw, and I have a question for um, Governor Mills. Um, Dr. Shaw, I was speaking to your spokesperson about um, releasing town-by-town -town data of the virus, and they told me that basically the state would have to see a certain level of cases before it could safely release that data without um, impinging on people's privacy. Do you have a number or an idea of how many more cases the state would need to see in order to feel comfortable doing that? Yep. Uh, so Caitlin's first question is whether there is a specific threshold at which we might decide to move to release town by town data. And, and there's, there's not a specific number at which privacy becomes con, uh, assured. It really, again, depends on the distribution of cases across the state. And, and so that's really more what we're looking at. Can we release town by town data such that in the smallest of towns, there are a sufficient number of cases. So by releasing those data, we don't compromise anyone's privacy. And I think when you look in states that have gone that route, what you find is that they have many times more cases than we do. If you take Massachusetts, just as an example, they have maybe six times our population, but 40 times the number of cases that we do. So a significant difference in the concentration of cases as well as the distribution of cases that enables them to release that data at a town by town level without compromising privacy. So it's not about the absolute number of cases. It's more about the spread of them across the state. Uh, and then I'll turn it over to the governor. Thanks. Um, yes, thank you. I just wanted to follow up on that quickly. Um, has the CDC ever considered releasing um, more town by town data in areas where the virus is the most concentrated, like in Cumberland or York County? Uh, it's so, uh, Caitlin's follow-up is, have we considered doing the town-by-town -town release in areas where the virus is more concentrated? It's something that we've looked at, we've discussed it, uh, but I think the, the broader point, though, Caitlin, is that there is an assumption underlying the town-by-town -town release of data that in areas of community spread, I, I, would, I would just want to be very clear about, in, in counties like Cumberland and York, where we know there is community transmission. The presence or absence of the virus in any one town should not determine the steps that people are taking in order to stay safe. And so you're right, in areas of higher concentration, there may be more privacy protections, but that assumption that underlies that, that my risk might be different because there aren't cases in my town and there might be in the neighboring town in York County, that assumption doesn't hold true. And it's actually a dangerous assumption because it can lead to people having a false sense of security. That, you know what, there aren't cases in my town, and so I don't need to practice social and physical distancing. That we know in counties where community transmission is occurring is not the case, and that false sense of security could actually lead to more cases and the secondary spike that we're concerned about. Thank you. Um, my second question is for Governor Mills is about um, the legislature. Um, last week, your spokesperson said that you were working on a way to keep the legislature informed without um, violating open meeting laws. Have you figured out a way to do that yet? Well, I don't think the uh, well, <laughs> the open meeting laws do not prohibit caucuses or meetings or briefings such as we conducted. Frankly, what we are doing is looking at the best ways to communicate as much information as possible to as wide an audience as possible. It's why we have. D daily briefings with Dr. Shah. It's why folks are on the radio, members of the cabinet are on the calling shows and on the morning uh, news shows and interview shows. And we're getting written information out there. Uh, we are trying to involve legislators as well as the rest of the public and the media in as widespread fashion as possible. Thanks, Caitlin. We'll turn next to Steve Missler at Maine Public. Uh, go ahead, Steve. Thanks for taking the call. Um, a quick question for Dr. Shaw. I think you mentioned this in your opening remarks. Um, also, I need to have a question for the governor, too. But first, Dr. Shaw, sorry. Um, you had mentioned that the, the, a high percentage of the active cases seem to be in these congregate 
care settings or long-term care facilities. Can you, do you have a number that you can pin to that? And then the question for Governor Mills is related to how and what ways are you coordinating with Vermont and New Hampshire? Specifically, what industries would you be looking at to, to make sure you guys are in alignment? You know, I think Governor Sununu mentioned something about beaches. He was worried that you know, he didn't want to be the first to open beaches in, Maine, uh, in New Hampshire because maybe people from Maine and Massachusetts would congregate there. I'm just looking for some examples about how this, the three states, the three northern New England states, are um, and what they're focusing on in their conversations. Sure. Uh, so, Steve, as to the former question about the number of active cases, uh, just a quick definitional note. What we mean by uh, an active case is one where our, our field epidemiologists, the folks I've spoken about, these are the ones that are doing that contact tracing that we've been doing for several, for a couple months now. They're the ones who are checking in on cases to see how they're doing and whether they can be deemed to be recovered. These are the folks that are doing that work. Uh, and right now there are roughly, very roughly, about 450 or so active cases. And by, again, active, that just means they haven't yet moved into the recovered box. So our epidemiologists are continuing the contact tracing and continuing with keeping tabs on them. We'll get the exact number for you in a bit, Steve, but it's roughly uh, what I just noted, about 450. Governor? A quick, quick follow-up, doctor, if you don't mind. How, um, how is recovered defined? Is that discharge from hospitalization, or is it a, how, do you, how do you define that? Sure, uh, so Steve's question is, what is meant by recovered? Maine CDC here follows the U.S. CDC's guidelines uh, and, uh, and criteria with respect to what is recovered. There are two ways someone can be recovered. The first is that they get multiple lab tests, each of which is negative. That was usually the, that was the definition that was used early on. But nowadays, the other definition is used, in most cases, which is a resolution of symptoms. Again, we'll get you the exact wording of the definition, Steve, but basically, in, in big picture terms, it requires someone having no symptoms for about three days without taking any medication that would suppress those symptoms. So Tylenol is known to suppress a fever, so you can't be taking Tylenol, and you have to have all your symptoms resolved for at least three days for a certain number of days after your first symptom. We'll get you the exact words. It makes a lot more sense when you read it rather than when I try to walk through it. And that's the definition that we follow from the US CDC for what determines when someone is recovered. Uh, thanks, and uh, with, respect, with respect to the Northern New England governors and the New England governors, we've all been having uh, conference calls. We had a conference call with um, all the New England governors Earlier this week, yesterday, the day before, and several conference calls with just uh, Governor Scott, Governor Sununu, and myself. Uh, and uh, on top of the all governors' calls with each other and uh, the governors' calls with the president, the governors' calls with the vice president, we spend a lot of time on the phone. But it's good information. We share a lot of advice and information uh, and what's going on in our states and our regions. So the, Governor Scott and Governor Sununu and I have talked about beaches indeed, uh, and uh, golf courses and um, uh, medical facilities. Uh, we're all talking to our medical providers. I think a lot of people, there's a, a lot of people who would like to open up um, healthcare providers to doing elective surgeries and elective um, procedures again. Uh, I think we all know that if one state does it, we all have to do it sort of in concert. Same with some of the other activities we've been talking about. Uh, we don't want to be an impetus to interstate travel because there are high incidence communities like Boston right now and Rhode Island and there are lower incidence communities like many of ours in Maine. We don't want to mix that up. As I said, one of the criteria that we're using in determining how and when to open up particular activities is does that activity um, invite in-state travel or in interstate into the state travel that might indeed spread the virus. So we're talking about those things, and I think we're in agreement on the basic uh, principles and parameters. Turn next to Dan Newman from the Maine Beacon. Go ahead, Dan. Uh, thank you. Um, Governor Mills, um, there's a bipartisan effort in Washington passed $500 billion in unrestricted aid to uh, states, territories, and local governments. Um, is that something you're tracking? Do you support that relief effort? 
and what priorities would uh, Maine have for additional unrestricted federal funds? Thank you. There's two different things he's asking about whether or not we support $500 billion money, uh, funds, extra funds, additional funds for the states. And yes, the National Governors Association, which you know I rejoined a, a little over a year ago after I became governor, the National Governors Association has taken a bipartisan um, uh, position in favor of such funding. And there are two different things going on, a bipartisan position in favor of fewer restrictions on the money that is already in the pipeline uh, so that we can use it to, in many cases, backfill budget holes caused by the COVID-19 virus. Uh, those are our goals. I don't know the status of the $500 billion. Uh, I understand uh, Governor Cuomo had a conversation with the president this week, some indication that he might be um, inclined to support that, but I can't speak for e either of those, uh, those gentlemen. We'll turn next to Don Kerrigan from News Center. Go ahead, Don. Yes, good afternoon. I have a question for Dr. Shah and then one for Governor Mills. Dr. Shah, first, it's about testing. And uh, we were, uh, and how much uh, testing do hospitals have? We were contacted by a woman, took her son to a hospital last night. The doctor wanted to test the son for COVID-19, but said he couldn't because they only had a very limited supply of tests. Is that still a problem at hospitals? Um, so uh, Don's first question is around the testing capacity within hospitals themselves. And uh, Don, I, I can't speak for any particular hospital. If that, if that child was at a hospital that had its in-house testing capacity, that might be a different scenario than one in which they are sending tests to our laboratory. Uh, but just to provide the numbers really quickly, right now, our laboratory has the capacity to conduct about 2,500 in tests. Uh, other laboratories across the state have varying capacities. Our laboratory team is on frequent calls with those other leaders of laboratories across the state to keep tabs on what the capacity is and what the supply of reagents are. But Don, you're, you're, the premise of your question is correct, which is not just in Maine, but across the country. There remains a challenge with getting some of the chemicals, the reagents that we need in order to offer testing more widely. Uh, we would like to be able to do so, but we know that that availability has been a challenge. In fact, just a few hours ago, my team and I were on a call with others, uh, with the federal government to discuss how we can go about asking for more supplies and to probe the federal government on their plans for getting us those supplies. So they acknowledge it's a concern and it's one that we hope that they can help us with. Governor. Hi, Don. And Governor Mills, uh question about unemployment benefits for self-employed. Uh, we had a story on today and we were told by the Department of Labor that the biggest obstacle to getting this going, providing benefits for people who are self-employed, are uh, problems with the computer program that the department uses to run this system and uh, not a, uh, a lack of guidance from the federal government. Uh, have we been slow to get our computer program fixed? Some other states have apparently have had similar problems. Some have uh, have dealt with it and some have not. So looking for question on that. Thank you, Don. The question is about unemployment insurance and is, is the slowness getting in getting payments out to self-employed and independent contractors due to our computers or something else? And it's a combination of things. Um, I was on a call yesterday with most or most, if not all, of the other governors, uh, and I asked the question: Is anybody has anybody had any success in processing those kinds of claims? I got no positive responses. That's all I can say. Uh, we're all having problems processing those claims, and I am extremely sympathetic, extraordinarily sympathetic, with people who have run their own business for years and years, who have not been part of the unemployment system, who now now find themselves with their doors shuttered. Uh, windows closed uh, and customers not allowed in uh, and we're trying to assess I think with the federal government right now in fact there's some kind of webinar tomorrow for all the departments of labor across the country to learn what kinds of documents we should be requesting which tax returns from what years many people didn't file tax returns for 2019 yet because hey the federal government postponed the filing deadline and then, of course, many, most of the states did also. Um, so 
getting the proper paperwork to assess what income level to base their unemployment compensation on is the big hurdle, I believe. Um, at the same time, the $600 checks, I believe they are going out the door, and the normal unemployment claims are going out the door, something like $100 million worth, I think. Uh, and the, the third tranche, the third aspect of the uh, CARES Act is what we're stumbling with, uh, uh, dealing with right now. All states are dealing with that, uh, trying to process that. Uh, we'll turn yeah, next. Follow up to, uh, I, Governor, the, uh, I believe the, that uh, Commissioner Fortman told our reporter that, uh, that they will have this system, I guess, up and running and working by April 30th. Are you confident of that? I, I'm very hopeful. I, I think all the states are talking to each other about addressing this problem urgently, expeditiously. The other problem is the federal government, the federal Department of Labor also sent us a warning yesterday saying, if you don't do it right, we're going to claw back the money, the OIG is going to come after you. So they're like giving and threatening to take at the same time. So uh, we're under the gun both ways. Uh, I'm going to turn next to Joe from ABC7. Go ahead, Joe. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. First question I have is for Governor Mills. Um, with this new public portal you have uh, for suggestions coming in from everyone in the public, what is your plan for separating a good idea versus an unrealistic <laughs> idea? <laughs> well, Heather's here. Her office is going to be uh, deeply involved in that. You know, this is similar to the process we used in two respects. One is the climate change initiative of last year, where Hannah Pingree set up a climate change uh, coalition. Um, and with subgroups dealing with different aspects of that. And we used the same kind of information and data gathering in that uh, respect. And then when Commissioner Johnson uh, uh, got the economic development plan underway, she also solicited uh, all kinds of ideas, suggestions from members of the public and businesses and employees from all over the state. And she can address that perhaps. Yeah, thank you, How Governor. Work? <laughs> yeah, so we appreciate um, and And honestly, every idea is a good idea at this point. We really want to see the information and the ideas that people have. So we look forward to reading through those. Commissioner Lambrew and I have put together kind of a joint team, Commissioner Lambrew with some healthcare work folks focused people and obviously our folks are talking with businesses and industry at, on a regular basis and putting that work together to look at business process business modifications healthcare elements that would add safety to those pieces so i think we'll look at at all of the feedback with those two lenses put together and and see how we integrate all of that work Thanks a lot, Joe. Thank you, uh, we're going to turn. Oh, yes, yeah, that's right. Have, uh, one more question for you. Sure. Um, with the uh, number of cases, and you're looking around the area, and we talk about the phrase flattening the curve, um, looking at the numbers of recovery cases and the numbers of positive cases we have, is this a result of flattening the curve, or do you think we're still playing catch up from the beginning of the shortage in testing we had? That is a good question. So, Joe's question is. To what extent are we now not just discovering cases from a while back, and especially with respect to those who have recovered? Um, Joe, it's, as you can imagine, it's difficult to know. But what we can say is that many of the cases that have been most recently diagnosed are individuals who have, been, who have had symptoms. And given what we know about the duration of those symptoms, which is to say for a few days, it suggests that the cases that we've been most recently detecting and reporting are ones that are part of ongoing infections, as opposed to cases that are from a while ago that are just now being detected. And a lot of that has to do with the way the test works and how long the virus is known to stay in the body. I think the bottom line there, Joe, is that again, we're still in the middle of it. We're still in the middle of things, uh, and this is not detecting things that happened a couple of weeks or months ago. Um, I, thanks, Joe. I'd like to turn to your colleague, Dustin, from the New England Cable News Network. Go ahead, Dustin. Thanks, Dr. Shah. The question's uh, for the governor. Sure. Is there a plan with no dates attached to it to open up the state in a regional way, or is there a metaphoric stack of different reopening flowcharts, something <laughs> based on certain data like positive test rates? I, I guess, what's your process like, or is this really all coming together in just the course of the next week or two? Boy, uh, little of little of all of the above. We're developing the epidemiological um, measurements, what we want to rely on as we go. But we're also through DECD and through this portal, inviting people to give suggestions. We're also looking at different sectors of the economy, not regionally 
in the state of Maine, regionally perhaps in northern New England, but looking at different sectors and different activities and inviting people to help us develop ways where those activities can be conducted and then running those, vetting them through the public health experts, can it be done that way? You know, and it varies so much. It's not just about how many days have passed. It's not just about uh, what the weather is like or anything like that. It's about, you know, how to conduct educational uh, classes, how to conduct church services, services. How can you do elective services, services and procedures in a safe way uh, without inviting congregation of people? Uh, how can you allow some of the hospitality sector, whether it's marinas or uh, lodging, uh, meals and lodgings places to open in some respect, maybe in baby steps, maybe very gradually, but allow them to do business again. Uh, so we're looking at the economic uh, interests and the public health interests and trying to bring them together. We'll turn next so is there to. A percentage that you think you you are on the way there. Like, is this is this eighty percent done? You're going to get twenty percent public input, or or you don't know that yet. No, there's eighty percent of what? I <laughs> know. No. Uh, you can like measure. Is, you is can, this an eighty? Like, how formed are these different plans, or are these all kind of just pieces that are all kind of scattered out in a metaphoric table? There's no metaphoric table. We have our guiding principles and a vision for what Maine can do and should do. That's what we're following right now, working side by side with the public health experts and the CDC uh, to figure out how and when to open up different sectors of the economy in the coming weeks and months. Thanks, Dustin. We'll turn next to Patrick Whittle from the AP. Uh, go ahead, Patrick. Um, I have a, I have a ultra specific question that I assure you we are posing to all 50 states and this is not just me being weird. <laughs> I wonder, what a wind up. Okay. I think uh, he said he was being yeah, weird. No. <laughs> Sorry, Pat. Believe me, it gets better. Um, so we've, uh, we've heard some reports that there are concerns that the virus can end up in sewage, and we're wondering if states are doing anything to address that at treatment plants or with septic systems. And we're also wondering if there are any cases where someone tested positive after coming in contact with sewage. Oops. And I totally respect if you don't have the answer to this question right off your head, because there are many things that you're thinking of, and maybe sewage isn't in the top 10, but if it is, I would love to know. Uh, so Patrick uh, has some very probing questions about sewage uh, and, um, and, and whether we have thought about the possibility of sewage as a, a mode of transmission. Uh, Patrick also assures us that he and his team are asking that question of all 50 states. So uh, the, the answer, Patrick, is that we are thinking about that. Um, there have been some early reports around that very distinct possibility. We are not aware of any single case in Maine that has been attributed to contact with sewage from, say, a sanitation worker. Uh, nor is the concept of, of getting coronavirus from sewage one that has been proven. But we have talked about it. And the other way in which we've talked about it is working and thinking with, uh, with some academic colleagues about to what extent there could be a role for testing sewage to try to get a sense of how much of the virus is out there. Uh, this is something that's done in other contexts, not least of which is during the opioid crisis. And so, Patrick, it is something we've thought about. We haven't made any decisions on it, but it's something we're thinking about. It's something we've had discussions with academics about because of the potential research applications to try to get a sense of how much of the population at baseline might already be infected by coronavirus, as well as to monitor the changes in that. So it's on our radar. Um, it, it is an ultra specific question, but it turns out to be something we've thought about and are continuing to think about. Uh, last question today goes to Brad Rogers from WGME. Go ahead, Brad. All right, thanks very much, I appreciate it. Um, this is for the governor. Uh, you know, tens of thousands of Mainers rely on summer tourists. It sounds like what you're saying is tourists from Massachusetts, Rhode Island, maybe other states are the last thing you really want to come into Maine. 
is there a way to open up Maine safely to tourists? And, uh, you know, what, what sort of weight are you giving all that in your discussion? How are you going about talking about that? What's been sure, about? sure, Brad. It's a lively discussion we're having every day. Uh, while monitoring the situation, not just in Maine, but in New Hampshire, Vermont, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New York, Connecticut, New Jersey, people who come here from those states, we have got to be careful that they're not bringing the virus. Right now, the executive order stands, still stands, that people coming here from other states, for not for purpose that is deemed essential, like health care work, um, have to quarantine for 14 days. That is still the rule. That's the law, basically, under the executive order. Um, this is April 23rd. So every day, every week, we are working towards reopening, reinvigorating, reviving our economy, reopening our state. I would love to see the tourists come here again in July and August. I hope it can happen. But again, we're taking it every one step at a time, watching other states, and making sure that people don't come here from high incidence areas to, a, to low incidence areas in our state with the result that we have a surge of the virus, a surge in hospitalizations, a surge in the use of ICU beds, surge in the use of ventilators, and more deaths in this state. That's what we're balancing right now. Yeah. Thank you, Governor. Thank you. Uh, let me just uh, say in, in closing, if I may, um, these are very, very hard decisions every day. I'm so pleased and proud to have people like Commissioner Johnson and Dr. Shaw, Commissioner Lambrew and others, part of this team that are listening to you, the main people, every day and trying to balance the concerns of the economy, trying to m balance the, the saving of lives and livelihoods at the same time. We want to do that. We're hoping to do that with the help of all Maine people. Somebody wrote me last night and said, the success of your mitigation efforts to slow the spread of COVID-19 virtually ensures that some people will say there never was any real need to worry in the first place. The lives saved, he wrote, will never know that they would otherwise have been lost. And those that love them will never begin to appreciate the benefit of our protection. I thank the gentleman for his words, and I want to assure the main people that, again, all of our decisions and considerations are based on fact, science, public health data, and common sense. And finally, I want to share something with Dr. Shaw because today I got in the mail. I want to thank Carter and Connor from Saco, Maine, for sending this beautiful, I'm sure it's handmade, card enclosing a five dollar bill oh my gosh. thank you for all your hard work and they want us to buy an ice cream cone when this is all over with jimmy's and i'll share that ice cream cone with my friend dr shaw buy you one when this is over thank you governor thank you, <laughs> thank you. an honor <laughs> and thank you to carter and connor all right thank you very much everyone we'll talk tomorrow and that was a lighthearted ending to today's COVID-19 briefing from the Maine CDC and from Governor Janet Mills, in which there was some very sobering information imparted. Uh, Dr. Shaw announced that uh, we've seen the biggest one day total of deaths in the state that's been reported, five deaths since yesterday, all of them men who were living at the Maine Veterans Home in Scarborough, uh, one in his 50s, a couple in their 70s, a couple of them in their 90s. Of the 44 total deaths in Maine since this pandemic began, 23 of those deaths have come in such long-term care facilities. Our total number of cases today is 937. That's up 30 from yesterday. Now, Governor Mills was on hand to talk about a gradual, safe reopening of Maine's economy. She points out uh, if you reopen too soon and too aggressively, you invite a second surge of coronavirus cases. So she's talking about a cautious reopening with no artificial deadlines, just public health considerations. The stay at home order, which is in place until April 30th, remains in place. The governor says she doesn't know yet whether it is going to be extended or not. They're going to be looking at the data in the coming days leading up to the end of the month to find out if it can be lifted or if it needs to continue. Now, the uh, governor also points out that uh, 
uh, the decisions they're making about when and how to reopen are not about a month or day or season, but about what is practical and safe, and they'll take it one step at a time. Life will not return to normal anytime soon, the governor said. We have to come up with a new way of doing business, a new way of recreating that can keep people safe. They will be guided by three principles. Uh, there are four principles, I should say, protecting public health, maintaining health care readiness so we can deal with another surge if necessary, building reliable and accessible testing so that they can keep track of where the disease is, and prioritizing public and private cooperation. In that sense, they are talking about reaching out to businesses to regular citizens to offer their ideas uh, and about to develop uh, the uh, industries and various sectors of the economy ideas uh, on how they can practically and reasonably uh, develop protocols to allow them to resume safe operations. At the same time, the main CDC is developing criteria to uh, determine uh, f when a phased reopening of the economy can happen. It will also be developing measures to detect the resurgence of the virus that may necessitate reimplementation of restrictions. And the governor also talked about how she, uh, it's very important that she continues working with other governors, the northern New England governors, of New Hampshire and Vermont, but also all across New England and across the Northeast because summer tourism season is coming and we want to make sure that we don't invite tourism when it isn't safe. All of the states want to try to lift restrictions in some measured and coordinated way. We'll be hearing lots more about this tonight on News Center Maine beginning at 5 o'clock. I hope we'll see you then.